Um, we're now on to our amazing first speaker, which is Lena Lau. Her talk is, you can be an iOS hacker, stack pivots, and drop drops. So a big round of applause for Lena. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. All right, awesome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining me here today. My name is Inverse Cos, or Inverse if you want to keep it casual. Uh, my government name, because we all live in, we're in Canberra right now, is Lena. So today we're going to be talking about iOS, and specifically I want to be talking about stack pivoting and job drops. iPhone versus Android in various different countries, it shouldn't come as a surprise that in Australia and United States, more people have iPhones than they do Android. But the reality of the situation is Android does dominate the global market share of phones, uh, obviously in countries like China. Our usage of mobile phones has been pretty crazy. Like 60% of all internet traffic now comes from a mobile device. I saw this stat like a few weeks ago where there was like a high percentage of Americans that are mobile only users, which means they don't even own like a desktop or a PC. They just do everything on their mobile phone. I'm not gonna like take you to Yap Town about how important mobile phones are. I'm sure we all know everybody has a phone. I'm sure you can look at someone next to you, they're probably holding a phone. I know I, for one, like basically sleep with my phone under my pillow. Uh, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is that your phone is like a catalog of your personal life. And so it should come as no surprise that it's a very attractive target for a large number of people or organizations. There have been a lot of articles coming out from Amnesty International and also from Citizen Lab talking about this concept of, it's a bit of a BuzzFeed title, but like governments can hack into your phone when you sleep. And this is really the case. Like last week there was this blog, art, it's not really a blog, like a news article about how the Colombian president was urging their civilians to check their phone for the advent of Pegasus. And Pegasus is a spyware that's developed by an Israeli organization called NSO Group. And NSO Group, you know, I'm sure like some, some people in the audience may have heard of them before, but back in like 2021-ish, they were blacklisted from the US government. And earlier this year, there were conversations around actually banning employees from NSO Group from actually entering into the US. Now, I personally love a little, did my mic just cut? I personally love a little bit of irony. So the US government actually has been a previous client of the NSO group, and they purchased spyware from them, uh, but under a holding company, under a fake front company called Cleopatra. Now, why did I go yap about all of that? And the reason for that is I want to talk about, I want you guys to know kind of the context for why we're even having this discussion today. And then I want to talk a little bit about how transparent the industry is, how difficult it is for someone to get into it. And then I want to talk a bit about memory corruption, bugs, and then stack pivoting. So when I really wanted to get into iOS hacking, there was really not that much information out there, and I kind of felt like I was just, I just kept hitting my head against a wall. Like, it's completely different to learning about exploiting Windows. If you just try to learn how to exploit things on Windows, there's a million articles on the internet, YouTube videos, step-by-step -step blog posts guiding you on the latest ways of, you know, uh, bypassing EDR techniques, whatever. But it's not the same for iOS. You have books that are really dated that don't apply for recent versions. You have literally like not that many POCs out there on GitHub. You're, you're, there's not much information out there and not many people talking about it. And when I started learning about hacking iOS and trying to get into it, 
uh, just, just as an aside, I'm a bit of a masochist. I absolutely love the feeling of being a noob and like knowing nothing about something and then the process of like unnoobifying myself. So I, this is just something that I really like. So one of the best things that I found for learning about this was actually the Project Zero blog posts. Now, for those of you who don't know what Project Zero is, it's a, it's a group of security researchers at Google that band together and they write research and technical blog posts about uh, zero days that they find in the wild. It's not all iOS, it's like iOS, various other devices as well. Now, the issue with these blog posts is they're not exactly beginner friendly. They kind of just go straight in. It's like bam, you just go straight into it. And so if you're new to like learning how to hack iOS, you, you, you're going to be reading this thinking, is this English? It's really hard to understand. But what Project Zero have done is they've published like exploit chains and kind of step-by-step -step walk through how those exploit chains work. And it's really, really interesting. And I wanted to bring up this uh, tweet, Zeet, or whatever the, whatever the term is, uh, that Valentina put up, which was, to her follower list, what percentage of software developers do you think can read a Project Zero blog post and actually understand high level, or just like a little bit of what's going on? I'm gonna guess most of her followers are like InfoSec people, but that poll had around 4,000 people voting. And the guess was that maybe zero to five percent of software developers can actually understand one of those blog posts. I do have to shout out that like the Venn diagram cross section of software dev and infosec isn't exactly like one to one crossover. So naturally some software devs have no idea what Project Zero is. So maybe that, you know, contributed to the, uh, the voting. But nonetheless, they are very, very difficult to understand. And because there's not much information and you know, you're relying on these technical blog posts to kind of learn what's going on, some people have a different opinion. Uh, there was this blog, this blog and tweet that was published a few months ago by someone called Michael. I don't know him personally. But they wrote a blog post that Project Zero should actually stop publishing these blog posts altogether. And their reasoning was because Project Zero published a series of Zero Days Found in the Wild blog posts, et cetera, and that led to burning a nine month long counter, counter terrorist operation that was being run by a US allied government. So it was a nine month long, nine month long government operation, something to do with counter terrorism. And because Project Zero came out and published the technical details of that particular exploit, it resulted in them burning that operation. And naturally, this like caused a lot of debate in the InfoSec community. Some people stand Michael's POV, some people stand Project Zero's POV. But Project Zero came back and was like, you know, yeah, like maybe the Western governments are the ones using these exploits on counter terrorist operations, but it's only a matter of time before non Western governments use these against us for, I guess, lack of a better word, counter, counter, counter terrorist operations. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, this kind of discussion around whether or not you should be publishing these things and actually even letting it out on the market. Another reason that I found, and one of the reasons why maybe people are not so open to publishing things or teaching people or, like, elucidating the realm of iOS exploit is there's a lot of money in the market to be made. I'm sure a lot of people who are bug bounties or like people who like, you know, people who like money would have some familiarity with what Zerodium is, but for those of you who don't know what it is, they essentially buy exploits from you that you find. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here is actually, if you look at their website, they, sorry, they will pay upwards of 200,000 USD up to 2.5 million USD for an Android full chain with persistence, zero click. Why I wanted to point this out is, compare this to the Windows market, compare this to how much an exploit would go for on the market if you were finding something, maybe like an RCE on, I don't know, like a Windows desktop, Windows server, Mac, etc. The upward range for how much they would pay for, I guess, a server is one mil. So the mobile market, is more than double the amount that you can make. 
that reduces the incentivization for someone to go forward and just be like publishing pox for cloud or whatever it is. Like, you know, you're not talking about an insignificant amount of money here. And what better person to get an idea of where the market is headed than from Mark Dowd? He did this amazing keynote at Blue Hat last year. I really recommend you guys watch it. I basically took this from his slide deck and his prediction for how much a full or close to full compromise will go for in the future for mobiles is upwards of 10 million USD. So 2.5 in the future, potentially 10 mil plus is not, a, is not an insignificant amount of money. If you think about this from an espionage standpoint or like a government standpoint, the information that you glean from a desktop and a server is not as interesting as the information you would get from a device that someone literally uses for, I don't know what your average screen time is, but like four hours, I'm guessing, like four hours a day. Like the amount of information you can glean about a person's life, it's completely different. And on top of that, it's really hard to find, it's really hard to develop exploits and things on iOS. Project Zero also maintain a list of zero days in the wild, and this is a public spreadsheet of zero days in the wild, and all I've done is I've just aggregated the last five years, just dumped it together into one spreadsheet. So this is everything from 2019 uh, to 2024. There's one glaringly obvious pattern that's like popping out in your face that I've also highlighted in yellow, so I hope even though you guys might be tired, you see, you see this? Uh, basically all of them, if not except for three, are all memory corruption vulnerabilities. And what I also kind of want to highlight is, okay, I don't have a cursor on the screen, is that if you take a look at the second last column, root cause analysis, a lot of them don't have write-ups. It's just a CVE link not much documentation, nobody really talking about it. It's, this just really, it's completely different than the Windows space. A lot of these memory corruption vulnerabilities that you're looking at on the, on the previous slide, uh, a lot of them impact the heap in some kind of way. And so memory corruption, just for those of you who don't know, it's a class of different kinds of bugs, any, anything from uh, you can find a heap overflow all the way to like a use after free. It's a whole different, multiple different kinds of bugs. It's just an umbrella term. And they can occur on multiple different places, but as you can see here, uh, a lot of them impact the heap. Now, I just really want to do like a 10 second what is a stack versus heap just in case we have people who don't know what this is. Uh, and by the way, I took this screenshot from like a CS 101 course and it gave me PTSD to uni. Uh, <laughs> What is a stack versus a heap? I'm just gonna give like a very high level description. Think of a stack and a heap as just an area in memory. And the stack is like a flight's departure board. It just tracks like the program execution flow. Like this function's gonna run, then this function's gonna run, this function's gonna run, et cetera. Think of the heap as just another part of memory that just every single time you use malloc, kalloc, it's just dynamically allocated memory. That's all you have to know. And so the problem with some of these memory corruption vulnerabilities, if they impact the heap, is that on an iOS device, you're not in this situation like Windows where you can just go on the side and like write, you know, code up a little DLL in your Visual Studio code and then inject that, you know, reflectively load your DLL. It's a different situation. You can't just inject and introduce like arbitrary code into the system and that makes exploitability a lot more difficult. And the solution to that is by doing something called gadget chaining. Uh, ROP chaining, ROP jobs, it's just, and what a gadget is, is a code segment. It's, your iPhone is running, and there's code running always on your iPhone. You're just reusing pieces of code that are legitimate and already exist on your iPhone, and piecing it together to achieve your actions on objectives. I hate saying actions on objectives, <laughs> whatever, I said it. You're piecing together pieces of code to achieve what it is that you want to do. But the issue is, is if you have some kind of control over the heap, you're not in a state where you can just chain like a full stack of rock, rock chains because you know, the function's gonna execute, it's just gonna jump back into the stack. And so you have this next problem of how do you chain mass amounts of gadgets on the heap? And one of the solutions to solving this is a technique called stack pivoting. 
And how stack pivoting works, and I'm just going to pull this nice diagram back up again, is at the top of the stack, there is something called a stack pointer. It's not that complicated. Just think of it like a finger pointing to the top of the stack, like, hey, what's up? The stack's here. And all it is is let's just say, you know, you see the stack, you see the heap, you introduce some kind of attack, you maybe do like a heap spray, you spray a bunch of objects into the heap, you have something sitting in the heap. All you're doing as the attacker is you're manipulating this stack pointer to point to a heap address that you wanted to point to. So the program now thinks, oh, what's up? The heap is now the stack. Like you've just tricked the system into thinking the heap is the stack. Then, from this point forward, you're in a position where you can do your evil actions, and these evil actions can be things like setting up a bunch of gadgets now on the heap. And then after you do your evil things, you can then have to restore the stack pointer back to the stack. Because, you know, your girl's not going to just let the stack pointer stay pointing at the heap for the rest of the, you know, for the situation. And yeah, so voila, you point the stack pointer back to the actual stack. That's basically like the TLDR of what this talk is about. There are so many benefits of doing stack pivoting, like, you know, you have better control over what you're doing, you're in a situation now where you can chain multiple amounts of gadgets on the heap, you're not faced with things like stack protections, and just as, as, just as an aside, I hope you guys are playing the game Deadlock, I'm obsessed with this game right now. I want to jump into some examples of stack pivoting, I guess, in the wild, where security researchers have published stack pivot chains, and I'm just going to show you literally every single example I could find on the internet. There's not that many. Uh, the first one is from a Project Zero write-up. It's a remote iOS exploitation. This was 2019. It starts off with a heap spray. They're just spraying uh, uh, objects onto the heap. Then they trigger the vulnerability, and then from there, they want to set up a ROP chain. What that means, again, is just reusing code on an iPhone and in a creative way to achieve your actions and objectives by stacking them one by one. So then to do that, they, they move forward into performing an actual stack pivot, and then they implement their gadget chain or ROP payload. I kind of have to talk about this a little bit because we're going to start going into some assembly. So I'm not going to talk about every single register in iOS and really cover it. This is just the bare minimum that you need to know. A register, think of it as just like something that holds some kind of value. And that value can be like a memory address, it can be like decimal, it can be <laughs> ASCII, like just hold some kind of data. And there is like X0 all the way through to X28. And these registers just hold some kind of data. Uh, X16 is a bit different. That holds syscalls. But you, know, you don't really have to know that for this talk. And then the only other three that you really need to know for this talk are X29, X30, and X31. X29 is the frame pointer. It just points to the stack frame in a function call. X30 stands for the link register, and every single time you run a little function, like your program function, and it hits return, the return will jump to the address stored inside X30, the link register. And then the last one, the stack pointer, is just what we were talking about for the previous slides. It's just the finger pointing to the top of the stack. Now, you are going to have to read assembly. There's no escaping this to perform this. Uh, I think assembly maybe puts off a few people because it looks, it's like, just looks like a nerd in a basement. But once you get over the unapproachable vibe of how it looks, it's so much easier than learning like, you know, another language. It's not as difficult as how it looks. I do think it's prettier than C++ though. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> so this particular stack pivot chain uh, from Project Zero went on for six gadgets long. And I don't have a cursor, but you can see like just the starting gadget, what Gadget Zero looks like. The next example I could find on the internet was from Alibaba Security. And this was from like a blog post they posted on Medium. This is a pretty old, uh, old blog post. But their stack pivot chain was pretty short. It was just four different gadgets long. And it's really succinct. Uh, it gets to the point. 
Just so that we kind of get used to looking at assembly, the actual pivoting is happening on the third square. I should not call that a square, it's a triangle, uh, not triangle, it's a rectangle. <laughs> the third rectangle where it's going move SP X2. Pretty simple to understand. It's just moving the value stored in X2 into the stack pointer. So now the stack pointer goes, oh, hectic, the, the heap is now the stack at this address. Awesome. That's literally it. Yeah, interestingly enough, I could not actually find any other example published on the internet. There's like the only two. Uh, I guess, I mean, I, I can't really speak to why that is the case. Maybe, um, I mean, I have some guesses, like maybe people don't want to publish their stack pivot chains because if you, you know, publish an entire stack pivot chain, it can be reused by other people and their exploits and maybe you don't want to help them because, you know, you want that money, you want that bag. I don't know. I don't know what the, the, the psychology behind it is. But this is kind of how we start doing it. I call this like the jigsaw puzzle because I really like jigsaws and I enjoy doing this because this to me is the same thing as doing a jigsaw puzzle. You have the starting point which is uh, you found some kind of heap vulnerability, some kind of memory corruption bug and then you have your end goal of I want to execute a stack pivot chain so that I can then set up my rot payload to lead into my next exploit or whatever, whatever you're vibing that day. And then you have everything in the middle. Questions that might be appearing in your head right now. What the heck is a gadget? Where do I find a gadget? How does this even work? Where, where do these gadgets live in? How many gadgets do I need to find? How do I even start approaching this problem? Where's the best place to start? All, the, all very natural questions that I also had when I was figuring this out by myself. So the first question that I kind of, you know, figured out was what kind of gadget, uh, what kind of gadgets exist? So a gadget is just a legitimate existing piece of code running at runtime on your iPhone. You're, you are just literally repurposing that code and piecing them together to achieve your goals. Your goal would be let's figure out a chain of different code segments that work together to create the stack pivot. And then from there, let's figure out other existing code segments that fit together to do my ROP chain that does whatever I want to do with it. This little three, three step, three step, three instruction sequence is just kind of what a gadget looks like. They're kind of short, not that hard to understand. Like, it looks crazy, but it's not that crazy. It's just storing a bunch of values into different registers and then returning. Ret just means return. And if I've lost you, just stare at subway, subway surface. <laughs> There's two different types of gadgets that exist. There is something called ROP and something called JOP. And ROP just stands for return oriented programming. JOP stands for jump oriented programming. ROP, like honestly, I don't know why they gotta make it so confusing. It's like basically it does similar things. Uh, ROP just ends in a return, you know, hence return oriented programming. JOP stands for jump oriented programming, so it's meant to end in jump, but obviously R makes everything a lot more difficult, so instead of jump, you have BR, which just means branch to a register, which does the same thing. So the first one, it just does something and then returns. And then the second one for job, it does something and then it branches. It's kind of the same thing as just jumping into the values stored in a register. Real world example of ROP jobs, just because I know people like having these examples of just gives context to why we're even talking about this. I loved this write up from a secure list, Kaspersky. So one of their security researchers was targeted and they were targeted with a zero click exploit where they received a PDF file and just in how that PDF payload was rendered, it led into this series of exploits being chained up. The ROP job component part of this, you can see I've highlighted in, I've highlighted in a cute purple color, don't know if that's purple or pink, uh, I've highlighted there. So attackers create an iMessage account, they send this person a PDF file, the payloads in the PDF file, how it's rendered exploits this particular CVE, then it leads into a ROP job. That ROP job sets everything up so that leads into the next exploit, which is a pack bypass, pointer authentication codes, just a mitigation on iOS, and then from there a series of other exploits were chained. I want you guys to see that when you are sitting in a situation where you are exploiting iOS, it's not as simple as let me just find one CVE and that one CVE is 
is going to just get me, you know, get me, uh, you know, RCE on the system or root, root the system. It's not, that, that's not a feasible way of seeing the situation. It's really complex. Exploits are chained. And then ROP drop is just a technique. ROP drop, stack pivoting, it's all just a technique that facilitates your ability to craft these exploit chains and, you know, hopefully get more reliable. And so our goal is we want to find a sequence of ROP job gadgets that allow us to perform this so-called stack pivoting. That's our end goal. And just to warm us up a bit, I want to go and look at this Alibaba example. I think that this example is an example of a, an elegant stack pivot chain, but not highly effective now because it's, this, these, these gadgets don't exist. Uh, so Alibaba Security found these gadgets inside Lib system uh, platform Dilib. I'll talk about what a Dilib is later. Uh, but basically, at the very start of this stack pivot chain, the threat actors, I should not say threat actors, the, attack, the attackers, the security researchers, they control X0. All that means is, there, is, there are values inside the memory uh, location of X0 that maybe stores like an address on the heap that they want to fake the stack at. The first two lines here in red are just setting it up so that they can get that value transferred from their control, which is X0, into the X2 register. All that means is they need to get that heap address that they want to fake as the stack into X2. So the first two instructions are just doing that. And then from there, they're moving the value of X2 into the stack pointer, and that's the actual stack pivot. The Project Zero ones are a lot more realistic. Oh, when I say realistic, I'd say like realistic now. Uh, so basically how this works is the threat actors or the attackers or the security researchers, don't know, don't know what to, all of them, <laughs> do a heap spray and then from there, the attacker controls X0. So X0 contains an address on the heap. I'm not gonna go through the entire uh, Project Zero stack pivot gadget chain, just the stack pivot part. And I've abstracted this heavily to not freak people out. So <laughs> at the very end, the first instruction looks crazy, but all it's doing is just think of it like pushing things onto the stack. It's just going, put the value of X8 and X1 onto the stack. Just push this crap onto the stack. And then the next gadget just pops it off the stack into X29 and X30. Pretty simple to understand. Just pushing, putting values onto the stack, and then putting those values into X29 and X30, which we know are the frame pointer and the link register. So when we hit that next instruction ret, it's going to jump into the address stored in X30, which is the function of what a link register does, and that is the X30 register is going to have the value of the next gadget. So now we've jumped, ret retted, into, <laughs> retted is such a weird way to word it, uh, retted into gadget four, and then all that's doing is taking the value of X29 and putting that into the SP register, stack pivot, a stack pointer. And that is actually just the stack pivot component. So just to reiterate, the heap address that we want to fake the stack at is stored in X8. That value is then popped off the stack into X29, and then from there, the stack pivot gadget moves it into the stack pointer. That's literally all that's happening. But a very logical question you might have is, at the start of this execution flow, we know that the attackers control X0, so how do you go from controlling X0 to getting something into X8 and X1? And that's where you have to find other gadgets, and this is why I call it a jigsaw puzzle, to fill in the blanks to lead you to that point. I want to show like a very high level diagram of how this would work, because I think a logical question at this stage would be like, you find these gadgets, but what do you do with them? <laughs> like, how do you put them in memory, or what does it look like? So. This white square, I keep calling it a square, this white rectangle is just memory. And this first memory is just the address 0x lead. And the register x0 is currently pointing to that memory region. Let's just pretend this is a heap. Let's say you as an attacker just does like 
You as an attacker does a heap, did a heap overflow. English is not my first language. <laughs> you as an attacker did a heap overflow, and let's just say you overflowed it with 41s. Oh, sorry, with A's. And then instead of doing that, you might want to uh, manipulate your payload. So instead of A's, it's just gadget one's address, gadget two's address, maybe some rubbish, gadget three's address, so on and so forth. And so what this would look like in theory, this is like a very uh, TLDR version of it, is maybe at the current address of where X0 is pointing to, you have gadget one's address and then gadget two and then some rubbish, gadget three, then you have your stack pivot gadget. So what these three gadgets are doing before the stack pivot gadget is setting up the registers so the stack pivot gadget you chose works. And then from there, let's just say, like you probably wouldn't be right after it, you set up your ROP chain. A logical question now is, okay, but you know, Lena, you mentioned the heap, you can't just be ret, ret, ret on the heap, how do you then execute all these gadgets before you even do a stack pivot? And that's where the concept of something called a dispatcher comes in. Let's just say we're trying to execute gadget two all the way to the stack pivot gadget. How are we supposed to jump across this space and get this to run? And that is the concept of a dispatcher, and all it is is just a fancy term for a different kind of job gadget. This is a very simplistic example of what a dispatcher might look like. You have X0 register storing the address of something, of, of a gadget. And you want to now execute this particular stack pivot gadget that is stored 24 bytes after the original position of what X0 is pointing to. So what you would do is in this particular gadget 2 address, you would put a dispatcher gadget. And all the dispatcher is doing and all this assembly is doing is it's just going X0, don't want you to point there anymore, point X0 plus an offset of 18 hex, which is 24 bytes, and that's your new value. So now X0 no longer sits there, it's pointing to here. And so the next instruction where it goes branch to register X0 is going to read the value stored in X0. And because we've gone X0, you don't sit here anymore, you sit X0 plus 18, 18 hex, which is 24, you sit here, the value that we're jumping to is the stack pivot gadget. So that's how, you, uh, that's how you navigate kind of getting your gadgets to run. This is another like diagram of how this would kind of work. I just kind of want to walk you through this so it's like drilled into your head. Uh, let's just say you do like a heap overflow, you've got your attacker payload, you've got all your gadgets, gadget one, two, three, rubbish, another gadget, all of that sitting in a dispatcher table. And let's just say like for this example, your first gadget's a dispatcher. The first gadget, all this first line is doing, it's just incrementing the uh, memory of X3 and X0 by zero, X0 plus 20 hex, and then the X0 is incremented by X0 plus 20 plus 8. Uh, and so the next instruction where it goes branch into X3 is just going to execute what X3 is pointing to, which would be gadget 3. So the dispatcher now allowed us to jump over this padding, run gadget 3, Gadget 3 executes, and Gadget 3 is just doing something like moving X2 into X4. What these gadgets do will depend on what you're trying to achieve. So obviously, in between your jumping or dis dispatcher gadgets, you would have gadgets that actually are doing something useful. And then it branches into X0. Now, X0 originally would have been up here where the dispatcher is. But because the dispatcher incremented the value of X0 by X0 plus uh, hex 20 plus 8 bytes, it's now pointing under this gadget right here. So that triggers the dispatcher to run again. And it just does the same thing because it's the same code, the same code, the same assembly. And that iterates gadget 4 to execute. Gadget 4 would then branch into X0 again, the dispatcher runs, then we go into gadget 5, dispatcher runs, go into gadget 6, dispatcher runs, etc. It's how you kind of get over these spaces. And so that leads into another question of, okay, cool, uh, where do we actually look for these gadgets? How do we find them? Where do we, where do we even start looking? The best place you can look for them is in something called a dilib. It just stands for dynamic library. 
if you are familiar with Windows, it's kind of similar to like DLLs, but the difference is in Windows, when, when you have all the DLLs, they're all just like listed, like, you know, all the DLLs are listed out. On iOS, they're all cached into one file called the dialed shared cache. Uh, this was after iOS 3.1. And th this is the, this purple, like, directory is where you find it. So you have to actually extract this cached file and then extract the dialibs from there. Uh, this is just me showing you on my phone uh, where, where it is. My phone's called Honeypot. Don't hack me. <laughs> so <laughs> dialib shared cache. Okay, there's two open source tools that you can use for this. You can use dialib shared cache extractor or you can use dialib extractor. Uh, you can see there's like 2,000 plus dialibs stored in here. So once I extracted that, the next step is that we're actually going to hunt for gadgets. Two open source tools you can use that I recommend, uh, Sasha's Ropper or Jonathan's Rop Gadget. I personally prefer Sasha's Ropper. No hate to Jonathan, just personal preference. Uh, all you have to do is point this tool at a dialib or all the dialibs that you've extracted and write what kind of instruction you're looking for. So for example, if we're looking for a stack pivot gadget where it's like move something into the stack pointer, then you would search for move SP. And then from there, it will spit out every single static address at a certain recursion depth inside this dialib that it finds this gadget in. And as you can see, it's just listed all of them here. And the red is just the static address. And then you've got the actual gadget sitting there. They're really short. But what this means is you have to pick what gadget to use. And you have to construct this jigsaw puzzle. And you've got to figure out how am I going to get all these moving pieces to work together. Another thing to note is like you, you're not going to just copy paste this address and use it. It's a static address. You have to calculate it at runtime where this actually sits. So I want to talk a little bit about this, the conversation between elegance and effectiveness. The Alibaba uh, pivot chain was really elegant, but you know, the, that gadget doesn't exist anymore. iOS developers should touch grass. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I don't really go outside much either. So uh, effectiveness means that the gadgets that you pick are likely to persist on other versions. And they're not likely going to be, you know, patched or, you know, they're, they're more effective. But what you end up with is you might end up with a gadget chain that's not like as sexy as the Alibaba one, like four gadgets, you might end up with longer gadget chains, but you know, they're more effective and the, these gadgets are more, they occur more frequently in the wild. So uh, one of the effective gadgets you can use for this is in the function epilogue. And I found these two in libdialib.dialib. These are the static addresses. It's actually one gadget that I'm reusing twice. So this, what you see on the right, left. Okay, yeah, what you see on the left is actually the gadget. And then all I'm doing in the gadget before that is just using it eight bytes after. So starting from LDP, I'm just repurposing one gadget twice. All the first gadget is doing is it's popping things off the stack into X29 and X30 and then returning to the next address here. And then the next, uh, the next gadget is just moving the value of x29 into stack pointer. And then from there, you would set up your ROP chain. And so that brings us to the question of how to approach this problem. And look, everyone has their own vibe on how they do things. This is just my personal opinion. I think it's easier to work backwards. So you start off at the point where you control x0. And I just realized someone might be asking, like, why, why do you start off at x? Uh, why do you start off with controlling x0? The reason for that is after you perform dynamic memory allocation, uh, like let's say you do like a malloc, x0 will contain the heap address where you've just allocated that memory in. So if we work backwards, it makes everything easier because you've got the starting point of some kind of control over x0. And then you've got your end goal of, I want to do a stack pivot. So once you have the stack pivot gadget that you've chosen, all you have to do is fill in the blanks and manipulate the registers, find gadgets that manipulate the registers in a way that allow you to achieve your end goal. Whereas if you do not start off with your stack pivot gadget and you just start off with controlling X0, who knows what fairy tale land you'll end up in and you're probably going to spend a lot more time filling in the blanks. 
So let's work backwards a little bit. The last one we saw pops things off the stack into x29 and x30, but then the next logical question would be how do we put something onto the stack? And so this particular instruction, STP, essentially achieves something similar, it pushes things onto the stack. And this one is found in libsystemc.dilib, and all it's doing is it's putting the values inside x1 and x2 onto the stack. Now, there's all these other instructions in there, and this is actually something I want to say, is when you are constructing a gadget chain, we don't live in this uh, wonderful land where everything is like perfect and there's no superfluous instructions. You might have gadgets that have other instructions, assembly instructions in there that mess up your registers, introduce random other registers, do some kind of rubbish, and then messes up your chain. You, you, and then you're going to have to find gadgets that clean that up or deal with it or select other gadgets. You know, it's not as straightforward as A to B, and sometimes gadgets that you want to exist might not exist. And so that then, working backwards, brings us to the next problem, which is we've put these values onto the stack, you know, but how do we get the values from x0 into x1 and x2? How do we do that? And to answer that question, this is what I've come up with. So gadget 2 and gadget 5 do exactly that. Gadget 2 allows us to write a value into x1, and gadget 5 allows us to write a value into x2. But here's the kicker. They're not really touching x0. They're writing these values from x8 plus a certain offset in hex. And so how do we go from controlling x0 to x8? And this is kind of design choice why I chose these two gadgets, is because both of them are reading from x8, which means it's, it only adds one level of work for me where all I have to do now is find a gadget that allows me to write the value of x0 into x8, which is what gadget one will be. And then from there, for me to iterate through these various gadgets, I just have to fill in these question marks question marks with dispatcher gadgets that allow me to kind of get to the next gadget, so on and so forth. This process is a lot of trial and error. It's like, I don't even know how to explain it. Sometimes like you end up with your stack pivot gadget and you work all the way back and then there's just like one gadget that doesn't fit and your whole world just falls apart. Maybe not that dramatic, but the whole thing just crumbles and you might have to start again and you know, figure out what to do. Because like if I go back here and I pick this, this gadget, there might not be other gadgets that exist that allow me to kind of fill in these blanks. Or I might find a dispatcher gadget that overwrites a value in a register that I need that value to be in that register. And so it is a lot, a lot of trial and error. Uh, the end result when I was doing this uh, for my reasons, this final payload is what it kind of looks like. This is, uh, this is really weird, but I think this is a me thing. This is how I like to visualize how, what I'm doing. As you can see, zero bytes is just at zero bytes where the actual uh, memory location of x0 points to. The actual payload itself is 272 bytes. The fake heap or the fake stack in the heap starts here at 304 bytes onwards, and that's where I set up my ROP chain. But what I want to point out here is that my gadget chain was eight characters, eight characters, eight gadgets long. And something to say is in a lot of my previous examples, I had, you know, like uh, stripped down diagrams where I had gadget one, gadget two, gadget three, gadget four. It's not like that in reality. Like, as you can see, I've got gadget one here, then it goes to gadget two, then it goes to gadget, sorry, gadget three, then it goes to gadget two, then it goes to gadget six. It's in different places. And the reason why that might occur is uh, maybe selection of what your dispatcher looks like. It could be a multitude of other reasons. But this is what my resulting payload looks like, and uh, all these other things like x81 is just how I track what is stored in each register. So I, you know, I like to just I do things very visually. And so takeaways from my presentation, I want to highlight exploitation. Hopefully, you can gather is extremely difficult, and it's very, very time-consuming. Uh, you are going to have to read assembly. The heap is unpredictable, and you know. Uh, oftentimes your exploit may not run correctly 100% of the time. There are ways to improve the reliability of it. 
And maybe there is a good reason why there isn't that many POCs out there, why there aren't that many blog posts out there, why there aren't that many people talking about how to exploit iOS. Firstly, there's the money component, you know, potentially $2.5 million, internet cloud, you know. Or there's also the added component of humanitarian uh, reasons and where your ethics stands around who would this exploit obviously be purchased by the government, who would be the end target of that. A lot of reasons around that. But because of that, and because there's not that much information about it, it's so hard to get into, and that makes it really hard to defend, because in order to really defend something or be able to detect something, you kind of need to know how everything works. Like, even when you're doing incident response, like, you really want to know how the attacks actually work. It makes you better at your job. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this today. If you really enjoyed this talk, I have an entire course on iOS exploitation. Uh, we actually reconstruct exploits. One of them is the forced entry exploit used by NSO Group. But other than that, I want to thank you all for your time today. Uh, if you've got any questions or anything, I'll be outside. I'll be around during the break. And you can always hit me up, preferably on Discord or Twitter on X. I'm chronically online, so I'll definitely be around. But thank you guys for your time. <laughs>